for the welcome. Uh, and uh, thank you also for Dr. Anna Kaplan for inviting me to this uh, conference and recommending my work as a keynote. And to our sign language interpreters, I appreciate that they're providing that for us. Um, so uh, thank you. So I want to start with um, acknowledging that you're going to see some awesome multimedia PowerPoint presentations today. And um, I too hope to witness some of them. And I thought for this keynote to present you also with some visuals. But ultimately, I decided to tell you a story. Because throughout this pandemic, I have listened to many that have taught me much and have informed my oral history practice. And so sit back and pretend you are listening to an audiobook or a podcast because there's some good storytelling coming your way. First, a bit of information about me that is not in my bio, but which does speak truth to the phrase, the personal is political, and how this statement unfolds in the work that I choose to do in oral history. Uh, I was born in 1977 in San Pedro Sula, Honduras, located in the northwest corner of the uh, country in the Sula Valley, about 31 miles from the Caribbean Sea. My mother was born on a shack on a banana plantation to a peasant family. She grew up poor and only received a sixth grade education. By the time she was 21, she was a mother and she decided to journey alone to the United States, leaving me behind with my great aunt. I reunited with her when I was five years old in Chiapas, Mexico, where she was living for a short time. Shortly after arriving in Mexico to reunite with her, I became extremely sick with chronic bronchial asthma, and the doctors advised my mom to take me to the United States quickly for treatment. And so in 1986, we journeyed together to Los Angeles, California. We were both undocumented and did not become naturalized citizens until 2008 for me and 2016 for my mother. For a long time, I thought my mom and I had immigrated to the United States due to a lack of access to health care and because we were poor. But I never stopped to ask myself why we were poor and why she felt she needed to leave Honduras in the first place. Over the years and through research and oral histories with my mom, I have learned about the devastating impact that the Banana Republic years had on Honduras. The U.S. was one of the beneficiaries of this mass agricultural exploitation of banana plantations, including the one where my mother was born and to which her family depended on for employment. And then a cataclysmic tropical cyclone struck in 1974. Hurricane Fifi Orlean destroyed the banana crops and everything else that grew abundant on the coast of Honduras. As a result, American corporations vanished without rebuilding and employment dropped. Around the same time, the U.S. expanded the use of the Soto Cano military base to serve as a surveillance post for neighboring countries El Salvador and Nicaragua during the respected US-funded civil wars. This brief timeline that I present you with starts, starts with the year that I was born, but the United States has been involved in the affairs of Central America for more than a century for its own self-interest. During the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, many people fled from the conflicts in Central America, and they sought protection in the United States. At the time, backlogs grew in immigration courts and asylum offices, much like we're seeing today. And as a result of this forced displacement, we also saw policies enacted at the agency level that intentionally denied protection to people based on their nationality. And so many years later, we are seeing how these policies and practices are impacting the current and ongoing immigration moment. In short, the story of the border and asylum is a cyclical one. 
where we see issues come up time and time again, and they have been not and they have not been fixed because the people who are harmed are the most expendable to our government and our society, and therefore there is no urgency to address the damage caused. During my practice as an oral historian focused on immigration justice, I have learned one crucial lesson from my narrators. Immigration doesn't just happen, it is forced upon people. Therefore, for many of the people I've done oral histories with, immigration is not beautiful. Immigration is not a monarch butterfly painted in vibrant colors on a poster. Immigration is trauma. Immigration causes memories too painful to remember or narrate. Immigration is state-inflicted violence. I'll say this again. Immigration is state-inflicted violence. We have to call it what it is. We must feel the weight of this truth before we can move forward with developing a response to the exodus of millions of people from their ancestral lands, their families, and their culture, not just in Central America, but around the world. And so if the state inflicts violence of people, which then forces them to migrate, what do we call said people who are harmed? I have often felt uncomfortable with the term vulnerable populations or marginalized communities. We see these terms in organizations, strategic plans, or project blueprints and research projects, but we don't often hear what it is that people are vulnerable to and how this vulnerability is produced or by whom it is produced. This is often unnamed and largely assumed. One meaning of the word vulnerable is to be susceptible to something, a bad something, such as disease or infection. Perhaps also imperialism or capitalism and neoliberalism, these last three do spread like a cancer, destroying everything in its path. A second meaning of vulnerable is to be capable of being physically or emotionally wounded. In other words, to withstand, weather, survive, tolerate. This definition for the people I've interviewed just doesn't fit because it implies that to be strong, one has to be able to, to uh, go through pain. People are not inher inherently vulnerable. They are made so. To call the people that I interview vulnerable is not to put the responsibility on the perpetrator of the harm. To call them vulnerable is to render them weak, helpless, and defenseless. It is to deny them the act of being seen as powerful, resilient, courageous, resourceful, tough, and hardy in ways that are unique to them. And yes, during interviews, narrators express a desire to be seen first as human beings and as fathers and mothers, hermanos y hermanas, daughters and sons, tíos y tías, doing everyday things, raising families, dancing, chasing after the chickens, enjoying their country's tropical fruits, acknowledging their elders, living mundane and ordinary lives. And they do too want to be acknowledged as people who were harmed by a cruel immigration system in the United States. They see themselves as people with dignity who were unnecessarily humiliated and punished for making an attempt at grasping for hope. Many were able to trace in their own words the exact period in which things changed for them in their own country. And then when we looked at the history of US foreign policy, we were able to see the cause. Oral history provides an opportunity to explore aspects, all aspects of a person's life and to help us question how we see the things that have happened to people. It helps us question the umbrella terms that categorize people into neat, easy to understand packaged experiences. The people I've interviewed are not inherently vulnerable. They have been fought, harmed by state inflicted violence. We need to consider other terms to speak about them. The environmental community, for example, uses threatened or endangered 
to identify any species that is in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. And they have developed protections for many of these species, protections written into law. We need to consider protections for populations of people who have experienced immigration as state inflicted violence. And we need to call out US foreign policy laws with imperialism and xenophobia at its center as the culprit of the harm inflicted. And so in the last year with all these ideas in mind, what have I been working on during a global pandemic? Separated an Oral History is a project that began in 2019 when my colleague Nara Milanić, a professor of oral history at Barnard College and I traveled with a group of students to a detention center in Dilly, Texas. We volunteered for a week as legal assistants and translators for families that were detained and were navigating the process of applying for asylum. Attorneys from Proyecto Dili, or uh, as it was formerly known, the Dili Pro Bono Project, approached us about doing an oral history project with a group of 37 women who had been separated during, from their families during the Trump administration's zero tolerance policy. The parents were eventually reunited with their children, but were then jailed for months at the South Texas Family Residential Center. These 37 families were a microcosm of thousands that were separated under zero tolerance and still more who were also separated under the Obama administration. Due to the incredible amount of work that Proyecto Dili was managing at the time, the collaboration with them did not pan out. However, Professor Milanić and I still wanted to collaborate on an oral history project with separated families. And so together we embarked on the process of understanding how we could do this work and if we should do this work and even if we were the right people to move this work forward. We understood straight away, straight away that we would have to interview threatened communities targeted by the United States xenophobic immigration policies. And so we asked ourselves the following questions. Should we do oral histories with families who have an ongoing asylum case or any open legal or immigration case for that matter? Could the narratives collected inform government policy to make even, to advocate perhaps for an apology from the government and for some form of redress or reparation? And lastly, we wondered if we could compensate the narrators for their time and the labor it takes to tell their story. And so we started with a listening tour. We engaged in conversation with oral historians who had experience working with threatened and endangered communities. The first that we spoke to was Dr. Virginia Espino, a professor, oral historian, and the film producer of No Mas Bebes, a documentary about the little known but landmark event in reproductive justice when a small group of Mexican immigrant women sued county doctors, the state, and the U.S. government after, after they were sterilized while giving birth at the Los Angeles County USC Medical Center during the late 1960s and early 1970s. The documentary is based on research conducted by Dr. Espino for her dissertation on population control politics and reproductive injustice. Virginia shared that our project needed to center the reclamation of dignity and integrity for anyone who has experienced state inflicted violence. And at the time of our conversation, Dr. Espino was engaged in conversations with several organizations on the establishment of a memorial and an acknowledgement from the institutions responsible for the sterilization. And specifically something that will center the efforts of the women who use their story in what Dr. Espino calls a historic multi-ethnic feminist legacy. We also spoke with Alisa del Tufo. Uh, she is an oral historian, professor, theologian, and founder of many organizations, but uh, primarily most focused recently on Threshold 
collaborative. Alisa's work, oral history work with survivors or domestic violence mobilized her to lobby at the legislative level and help create policy that resulted in federal, state, and local reforms, including the establishment of a $3 million fund for housing, for housing support for women survivors of violence and their children. Uh, changes, it also uh, advocated for changes in criminal justice, child welfare, and healthcare reform, including the development of specific services for batterers, battered women, and their children. She helped inform us that oral histories can and have been used to inform policy and guided us through the process of how that happened with the pro project on domestic violence that she spearheaded. Lastly, we spoke to Gabriel Solis. He is the executive director at Texas After Violence Project and also an oral historian. Texas After Violence is a community-based archive that preserves the voices, experiences, and perspectives of people directly impacted by violence in Texas. And Gabriel provided us valuable insight about the risks narrators may expose themselves to by participating in, or in an oral history project. He recommended that we work with attorneys on these and that sometimes attorneys will have to be present during an interview. And this is to protect uh, the narrator, to make sure that they're safe and that nothing is asked that can harm their legal cases or their immigrant status. He also presented us with something incredibly valuable, which was to compensate, the question of to compensate or not compensate. And he talked to us about how the narrators at Texas After Violence Project who participate in their projects are compensated. And he framed compensation as a way to allow narrators who are asked to discuss traumatic issues to take care of themselves. And the narrators themselves then define what care means. Listening with our whole selves to what Alyssa, Gabriel, and Virginia's work had encountered in their own oral history practice helped us understand what we were diving into, that we were diving into a project with unique and complex concerns that we would have to be ready and that we would have to be ready to pivot as many times as necessary to accommodate the needs and concerns of the threatened population we engage to participate in with. And so um, the first thing that we did is that by a stroke of luck, we partnered with the Women's Refugee Commission. In July, I was hired to spearhead their storytelling project. And their project what, wanted to interview uh, immigrants who had been separated um, and to use the stories for a, meet, a campaign to raise awareness about asylum and it's called Welcome with Dignity. And so because of my oral history training, we were able, I recommended that we do extended interviews. And uh, we did oral histories with folks and over the phone, all of them in Central America. We recorded using the voice memo app on my computer. Uh, sometimes uh, I, reached out to them on WhatsApp, but also sometimes on Skype when they didn't have WhatsApp uh, because everyone was living in rural areas, Central America, in small aldeas throughout Central America. Uh, Wi-Fi was irregular, so there would be periods of time that I wouldn't reach them. I had to try reaching them uh, at many hours of the night or early mornings. Um, and so, we established right away that this is, wasn't going to be your regular or formal oral history. And we developed, we also developed a dynamic verbal consent that was more of a conversation about consent rather than a, a form. Obviously, we couldn't use a form because um, we didn't have paper. Many people also had limited ed, uh, or different education levels. So we developed a, a verbal, dynamic verbal consent. And um, one of the most important questions of this consent was in Spanish, Dígame usted por qué quiere participar en el proyecto. Please tell me why you want to participate in this project. And this allowed for 
an ongoing conversation and for the narrators to tell me exactly why they were interested in this project and what they uh, uh, wanted to use for this project or um, why they wanted to um, participate. Um, and so we also had to remind ourselves that we had to join the narrator where they were. So sometimes they would be in the middle of their cornfield doing an interview with us. That is the only place where they could have a moment to speak, uh, to not be interrupted. Sometimes during the interview, we also heard roosters crowing in the background or dogs in a faraway road or um, the local party getting started, you know? So we had to just go with the flow and all this uh, environmental, uh, these environmental sounds helped and formed the oral history in unexpected ways. Um, and we also incorporated questions about reconciliation and reparations. We wanted to hear from narrators how they envisioned a better immigration system and what they felt that they needed from the U.S. government after they were harmed. And this uh, reclaimed their agency and um, acknowledged their um, experiences and um, the uh, impact that separation had on them, the impact that immigration had on them. And um, the project is still ongoing. I've completed 20 interviews so far, five more to go uh, for a total of 25. Um, oh, Sorry, I forgot to mention compensation, we, which is the most important because we really wanted to acknowledge folks as, um, the emotional labor that it takes to recount the traumatic experiences. We thought about using gift cards, but ultimately money is what people really needed. And so we uh, developed a system where we used um, um, uh, something called remesas, uh, people who live in the United States send money back to their countries all the time. And so use, we use the same process that they use to receive money from families in the United States in order to compensate them. So in conclusion, the project is still ongoing. Uh, it's already informing policy. Uh, just recently, I produced a brief for the attorneys uh, at the Women's Refugee Commission that are working directly with the Biden administration's uh, family re reunification task force. And the brief included excerpts from the interviews or on the needs that families have for reunification, which, which essentially includes uh, resettlement services. And we act, continue to advocate for a truth, reconciliation, and reparations commission for families separated by the United States government. Um, and so that's what I've been working on during a global pandemic. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. And um, I'm, I know I'm pressed for time, but I welcome any questions or feedback. 